live and direct. You're tuned in to the Bro Diallo Show. And I don't know why my... Wow, that was intense. Bring down the gain on my mic. You're tuned in live to the Bro Diallo Show, AM 1680. Broadcasting live out of the city of Chicago, the sanctuary city. If you're anything but a black youth, anything but in a person of African descent, apparently, this is the place to be. The sanctuary city of Chi-Town. Chirac for us, chi for everybody else. It is March 3rd, in the year of your Lord, 2017. AM 1680, did I say that? That's everything I need to say before I can get into the meat and potatoes of the show. So let's jump in with both feet. Bro Diallo Show. Welcome. Like I said, I'm broadcasting out of uh, Shytopia. If you are black and poor, black and female, black and black, black and unemployed, black and gangfully employed, if you's black, then this is Chirac. But if you are formerly known as illegal immigrant, but now I, I uh, um, we now calling that is now undocumented. If you are undocumented and unafraid, DACA, immigrant, Islamic, Sikh, Indian, or anything else that the average white redneck would mistake as being a Muslim, then make your way to the city limits of Chicago. Now, I didn't say Illinois because you know, you go to Southern Illinois, that's redneck town. You know, you out there by the wheat fields and the wind farms, eh, you haven't made it far enough. You know, but keep your eyes on the prize. Follow the drinking gourd. You know, and pay no attention to those black bodies lying in the streets. Pay attention, no attention, just keep keep heading north. Don't Don't stop on 115th Street, 95th Street. Just keep heading to follow the drinking gourd. Once you hit, I think, uh, once you hit Roosevelt Avenue, once you hit the Chicago Loop, then you can lay down your burdens because you have arrived in the sanctuary city of Shotopia that will welcome you with open arms, adequate resources, and like I said, kick off your shoes that's probably crusted up with the muck of the blood you had to dra drag through to get here. And welcome, welcome to the Shytopia. And, and I think, you know, what's even more tragic than a city that is literally engaged in ethnic cleansing, i.e. gentrification, polite way to say it, a city that is closing schools, closing resource centers, that is cutting off benefits, everything from WIC to housing assistance, that for this city's officials to have the gall, to have the gall, as we say in Missouri, more nerve than a toothache, to, to label itself as a sanctuary city, but, but it doesn't stop there. Our former, former Black Panther, Bobby Rush, and like I said, well, I ain't the one that said it, I think I'm repeating it. Dale Jones said, for you to go from prison to president in the name of Mandela, some deals were made. That ain't no hocus pocus abracadabra. You don't go from prison to president unless you didn't compromise yourself in some kind of way. Because I didn't see no military coup, I didn't see no, so, but you know, but if you go from Panther to Congressman, I still, hell, if you go from Panther to tenured professor at an elite liberal institution, I, I got to side eye you. You know, 
If y'all woke up tomorrow morning and, and, and picked the crust out of your eyes and you saw me in a tailored suit sitting on the Fox News, I would just have questions. I don't condemn me, but your questions would be legitimate. Like, huh, how you in here saying all these unpleasant things about capitalism and white folks and corporations and all that, and then all of a sudden they hire you? I would be surprised. I ain't even saying I wouldn't take the money and run. You know, because apparently, you know, especially black folks, nothing makes you know, there's no quicker path to, to black leadership than being wealthy and willing to say some, some, some halfway decent sounding black things. So I'd just be like Nick Cannon or T.I., Donna Turbin and say, hey, uh, guess what? I'm black this week. Yeah, black power. Everybody like, oh, you, you a black leader. Got money? Check. You been on TV? Yes. Check. And you said some, some halfway decent sounding black things? Check. Leadership for you. Where are we go? <laughs> What's the next step? Grand Marshal. But anyway, back to my, to, let's get back. Bobby Rush. Bobby Rush made the announcement that any undocumented people who feel under siege, who feel pressured or frightened by Trump's policies and, and immigrant rhetoric, or that if you just were, were out there, ass out, without resources, without shelter, Bobby Rush said that his local congressional office here in Shytopia slash Chirac, his local congressional offices here, and his D.C. official congressional office will be sanctuaries that you can come there for support counseling resources or if m you must be if the ice agents are hot on your trail you can even bring a sleeping bag and sleep and live in his office with his full might of congress of his with the full power of his office to protect you if you are undocumented don't take my word for it look it up Look it up. Now this man, he didn't just get elected to office today, yesterday, last week. I mean, King D, what, what are you coming for? You know I'm live. You know, call me at my y'all. Can't y'all y'all keep calling me while I'm while I'm live on the air? Anyway, King D, call call me on the show. Three one two nine eight five seven eight three four. Holla at your boy if you want to get in on on, on this conversation. So it's no longer shy town. It's no longer shy rack. We living in shytopia, y'all. And with all utopian visions, I don't know if you read uh, dystopian, utopian novels, or if you know about the utopian experiments throughout history. There's always a CD underbelly. There's always a, a, a unseen behind the curtain type situation, Wizard of Oz type setup. So, if you got to know, it's, it's kind of like, even the real Chirac, but you know, you got the, the La La Land of the Gold Coast, you got uh, the, the northern suburbs, you got, uh, what, what, what's it, Lincoln Park, Wicker Park, heck, you even have the campus, like, we need to start calling the, the Hyde Park and the University of Chicago, which is on the south side which is a white oasis, a white affluent oasis encapsulated by black misery. That's the green zone. Just like in Iraq. You have literally carnage going on everywhere and then they have like cafes and spas in the green zone. And for some reason, and I'd like to, I've actually had this conversation, but I'd like to bring somebody on the air because I grew up in an era, in the area that was, you know, had a higher murder rate than Chi-Town. But because it wasn't a big city, it wasn't, it wasn't a place that had celebrities and big movie sets and big, tall, skyscraping buildings, you know, the deaths just weren't as sexy. They weren't as groovy, you know, they just didn't get the airtime. So, um, but I went to s some gangsters, you know, because... You, and then, you know, back then, I don't, I, don't, I don't claim, you know, to know how the, 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 the rules of the game now. But I went to some gangsters and I asked them, I said, like, yo, you know, 
if if I wore the wrong colors, you know, if I crossed the wrong block, you know, I'd get it. You know, beat up, stab shot. And they were like, yeah, you know, you, you, you know, I was a, a neutron, I was a lame, I was a herb, herb, all that. But you know, nobody would really waste time with me. What no, you couldn't couldn't get money messing around with me. You know, you gonna you gonna jack me for my pro wings? Nobody was jacking people for pro wings, or members only jackets. But anyway, I'm like, you know, there's a lot of people that come through the through the hood, mailmen, letter carriers, and. There's a uh, social workers, sheriff's deputy, evicting y'all mamas from 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 the house. All this stuff, and and y'all don't do nothing. You know, y'all claim this is y'all hood, but your only people you harass are other poor, broke black people. When but anybody comes in here with the slightest amount of of authority, some five foot two, pot belly, balding, uh, cop, with with jelly donut grease on his collar, can come through here. By himself, with a rusty pistol, and y'all got AK-47s in your lap, and y'all scatter in all directions. He says, "Boo." But if another group of of of, of highly armed bangers come through, y'all gonna stand your ground. I'm like, I just don't understand this. You know. And even in the rap music, y'all say anybody can get it, but evidently only we can get it. And needless to say, they were like, "Man, you always talking funny." And sometimes it's funny, but right now you're not being funny like how we like you to be. So why don't you step off, man, before we mess you up? Man, you know, I'm ad-libbing a little bit. But, I mean, I did inquire. Because you'll notice that there's carnage all over the south side of Chicago. But if you can make it to 53rd Street, if you can make it to the campus of city of Chicago, right on the south side, like literally, you can pick up a stone and throw it between the areas that are safe, well lit, full of commerce, where people calmly and joyfully roam the streets at any hour, going to the various bars, bowling alleys, um, corporate shopping, hot core yoga, you know, vegan restaurants. And you could pick up a stone in this modern shy talk. Please. Call me at 312-985-7834 or text me, but I'm live on the air. I, I'm not sure why folks is calling me. Is there something up that, that I'm missing? Let's see. Let's see. Somebody try to see. Nope. Hey, text me, tweet me, call me, but everybody blowing up my phone while and messing up my train of thought. So, uh, Masozi, King Dita. Give me a uh, give me a uh, call on the on the air or text me or uh, Facebook comments. You know you you can get at me, but just get at me the way. But anyway, let me get back to what I was saying. You can literally take a stone and throw it from Cytopia and throw it into Chirac. And I seldom. See, because I'm in Chirac and Shytopia, I have Chirac money, but I have Shytopia taste. So yes, I live in Chirac, but I like my organic heirloom tomatoes. And right now I can't grow them because I do also, we have an organic garden firmly located in Chirac, but can't get them right now. So even though I have... Chirac loyalty, Chirac means, and Chirac residence. I venture into Chitopia to get coconut milk, <laughs> and and you know certain things you just can't get at the hood bodega at the gas station. Susumi, but what I don't see is oh I'm not on the radio. Okay, now that's that's something. Okay, let me find out what's what's happening here. Because people was hollering at me. Oh, okay. That's all on me, y'all. Thank you, everybody. That, uh... Thank you, Odolfo. I ain't gonna give y'all credit. Here we go. I did not... 
I'm not on the radio. I'm not on the radio. Radio, radio. Duh, duh. Okay, I, sh I should be live now. Thank you. Where would I be without my listeners? Talking to myself, which I, which I, I, I don't, I'm not really against doing that. <laughs> I'm not above it. I talk to myself because there's no one to talk to. People ask me why, why I do what I do. Anyway, I, technical difficulties. That's why, you know, I, I, I'm sorry. I, w I was actually out at uh, King Dita, out drinking with King Dita. Him beers, fufu, fancy beers, and, and colorful hand-painted labels on his beers. And, and I had my uh, green tea and root beer, the, the fancy root beer with the bearded white man on it. But anyway, I should be on the air now. Thank you, Brother Adolfo. Thank you, everyone else that attempted to uh, let me know that I don't have my uh, stuff together. Um, but anyway, let me get back to, to my topic at hand, which isn't even the topic of the day. But the topic of the day is so miserable. Literally, this topic has gotten me death threats over the past week. And if you don't believe me, I'll post the death threats. I don't know why I'm protecting these people. But I've literally gotten death threats and denounced. Just people bum rushing me. So maybe I'm just, it's safer to talk about gangsters than it is to talk about certain other issues. But I'll keep you in suspense because I, I want to talk about this. But like I said, Anybody who lives in Chicago or on the south side, now a lot of people tell me, not a lot of people, but some people tell me, you too south side centric. It's like you got black people on the west side struggling, in the south suburbs, far south side struggling. You got people on the north side, it's like the north side ain't all, you know, parasitic white capitalists living off the blood and suffering of everybody else. It's like you got black folks to live up on, you got downtown, you know. The old Carbini Green neighborhoods, and they still got some, some public house. He's like, black people are suffering wherever you find us in this Chicago. But all I ever talk about is the South Side. And I apologize for that. You know, I had a homie that lived on the West Side. He packed up. Y'all done ran him off to, uh, to um, New York City. You know, y'all done ran my man off. Now he didn't run up, you know, business man. He's he's a he's a, a serial entrepreneur. So he goes where the winds of opportunity blow him. But you know, I mean, like I, I he was over there, and uh, I would spend time over there with him and work on that. He had a building, and you know, I would help him install stoves and stuff for for his tenants. But anyway, I know. So it ain't just the South Side. Don't get me wrong. It's just where I live every day. It's where I work. It's where I organize. So I'm not saying or denouncing or saying that things are the way. I don't like playing oppression bingo, you know, to try to figure out who's more oppressed and who's less oppressed. Oppression is oppression. You know, the only time I get upset about different oppressed groups is when one group of oppressed or one demographic within the oppressed group try to compound the oppression of another group within the same oppression. That's when I think. But other than that, Oppression is oppression. We got to fight it all. You're either against all forms of oppression or you're not against oppression. You know, it's like, well, I'm, I oppose rape unless she's a slut, you know. Or I don't think a married woman can be raped by her husband. You know, so you're either against rape or you're for it. Ain't really no wiggle room. Ain't no gray areas in some, some arenas. Some arenas there are, but some arenas there's no gray area. So if what I'm saying is South Side centric, it's only because this, well, this is the best I know. But if you want to come on the show and talk about other areas, if you're anywhere in the country and talk about the struggles of our people, if you want to tell me about, you know, Nigeria, Honduras, Haiti, Haiti, you know, I'm not saying that any struggle is more valid than any other struggle. Or any suffering is more valid than any other struggling, suffering. But then, I digress. You can stand in an affluent capsule on the south side. And, in, and, and it's so close, it butts right up to the carnage. You could throw a stone from a nice, safe community and hit 
in a community where literally people are getting up in the morning to go to work, stepping over the corse, corpses of their children. But the, the, the people doing the, sh the shooters, the gangsters, killers, hustlers, the monsters, the thugs, the savages, they don't cross that line. It's like an invisible barrier, like a freaking shock collar. You know, like every now and then you'll hear about some, some dude snatching some, you know, University of Chicago student's iPhone or iPad. And when it happens, of course, it's a tragedy. There's a memorial service for that iPad and, 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 a, and, a, and a fund taking up for millions of dollars to recover that iPad. But for the most part, there's some psychological barrier. Dr. Bobby E. Rice said black people kill other black people because they've been conditioned to kill other black people and they don't kill white people because it's outside of their experience. We fought for equality within a system that was founded on the degradation, brutalization, mutilation, and murder of black people. And we said we want equality with this system. We said we want to be equal and walk hand in hand. So, I mean, I guess it logic didn't really tell us, inform us, many of us, that if you join a system that's based on killing you and trying to be equal and educated within a system that's based on killing you, you would start to kill yourself. Now my wife, she's, she's, she's way back Chicago. She's Chicago by way of Mississippi. Right? Her parents, grandparents, all Chicagoans. And, and, and my mother-in-law would say, I ain't going to tell her age. But she would say, I remember back when if somebody was slashed with a knife, a little pin knife, there would be a candlelight vigil outside the hospital. It was just the most horrendous thing. Yet we had fist fights and scuffles and, and ongoing beefs. But when the, when the violence escalated to bloodshed, not murder, not homicide, she said, like, one time, like, she was at the Bud Billiken Day Parade. I, I'm not going to give the exact year, but it was when TVs were black and white. And had a little antenna sticking out the top of them. Um, somebody had gotten stabbed or slashed at the Bud Billiken Day Parade. And the whole parade just went to the hospital and like, oh, Lord, how many stitches did he get? Twelve stitches. Oh, and women were fainting in the streets. Because violence was just, that type of violence was relatively rare. But we were segregated. We had not yet secured the equality with our oppressor. But then as we became more equal, more integrated with our oppressors, we began to be equal. Seeking equality with your oppressors makes you equal with your oppressors. Now, we thought for some reason seeking and securing equality with your oppressors will make your oppressors less oppressive. What made us think that? We had examples. Prior to the Civil Rights Movement, there was the, 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 the German Holocaust. The Jews didn't say, we want to be integrated. We want to be fully, we want equal rights within the Third Reich. They was like, no, get us out of here. We out this peace. So we, I, I don't understand why we are, or I don't understand how we can be shot. We can be, say, look, it was a miscalculation. It was a miscalculation. We want equality for some people who don't acknowledge our humanity. Fine, you want to be equal with me, that means you have to degrade your own humanity. Right? You have to, to, to devalue your own life. And it's not just the gangsters and the thugs that do this. If you look at the professionals, the physicians, the lawyers, the judges, the doctors, the architects and engineers, the social service professionals, the bureaucrats, the congressmen, the mayors, the senators, state and federal senate, congress, and the black president, they tend within the arena of their profession, within the duties and oath of their office, they tend to act just as bad, if not as worse, than their white counterparts. And if you don't believe this, if you need statistical data, there's a book called Disciplined Minds. 
And in that book, which is nothing more than a psychological, cultural, historical evaluation of professional, people in professional jobs, people with degrees, higher learning, technical skills, and higher status and higher pay, people who generally take oaths of office or oath of their profession, there's a section in that book that talks about black professionals. And they say, whether it's a cop or a president, that black professionals have been found to be no more sympathetic, no more empathetic, and no less likely to engage in discriminatory, discriminatory treatment of minority, of black people that come under their jurisdiction, that, that, is, that, that are their patients or their constituents, than their white counterparts. And, that, and it's documented. And if you don't want to go and read Jeff Schmidt, Disciplined Minds, then go and read Amos N. Wilson. And Amos N. Wilson stated that the collective progress of our people is inversely proportional to our individual achievement within the system. Which means as an individual black gets a, a position of status, the collective blacks glow down. Now I don't know, I don't think it's strictly because that individual black immediately gets into their office and starts to deliberately undermine us. Now there are examples of that, Clarence Thomas. Sneeze, cough, Clarence Thomas. Sneeze, cough, Omarosa. Sneeze, cough, Oprah Winfrey. Yeah, I said it. Sneeze, cough, many others. But not every one of them does that. Some of them just say, hey, I just want to fulfill my duties at, in my job and get home to my picket fence, my beautiful, often white wife, and my children, and live my life. Go to the mall and movies on the weekend and eat delicious foods that clog my arteries. And, and just be a good American. Not all of them are part, deliberately part of the conspiracy. But the issue is, there's a multiple layers. Like, if we see a black person in status, we got some black judges, y'all. We got a black police superintendent. We got a black mayor. We got a black congressman. Black, oh, we got these black people. So a lot of times, black people tend to relax. I mean, Obama was an eight-year hangover for black folks. So we're not as actively critical of the state and institutions of power. We're not as actively um, in opposition of them. So it's not just that these bureaucrats or black people, uh, striving blacks or, or black faces in high places or HNICs, head niggas in charge, are deliberately undermining us. It's a two-way street. It's just as much as far as that striving successful black individual as it is for us black folks. And then the fact that we define success in, with the literally identical terms that white folks define stress, uh, success. We didn't come up with our own definition of success or what success entails or what it will require. You know, if you go to a black community and say, what makes a black person successful? And most black people will say, um, see semicolon, white folks' definition of success. But anyway, just let me, because we got to deal with that too. So when Amos Wilson said that our collective progress is inversely proportional, here's an example. Black people, when we're outside the system, we tend to have more power and influence over the system than when we become in the system. I think the, the poster child of that is Thurgood Marshall. And I don't want to belabor this point, but you can go and verify what I'm saying here. Thurgood Marshall started off when he was in law school, a colored man in colored law school, learning colored law, and it was all segregated. And he thought, well, for some reason, being in this segregated here thing, I'm getting a lesser education. But he was said that he was taught in law school by his black law, striving black law professor. He said a lawyer can be two things an agent of progressive social change or a parasite. If you're not, if, if, if you are a Juris Doctor, if you are not a, a deliberate conscious agent of progressive social change, then you are a parasite. That's the only two things a lawyer can be in this particular society, in the way the law is set up. 
So he said, I don't want to be a parasite. So anyway, he became a famous NAACP lawyer. And this man accomplished more as an NAACP lawyer who was making crumbs, you know, who had one or two suits that he had to, you know, when he go and, and fight and try to get black folks out of jail, go before the Supreme Court and try to argue for our humanity and, and our basic rights, civil human rights. Dude have to take off his suit and lift up the mattress and lay it flat under the mattress because he couldn't even afford to iron his clothes. And he was able to do more for us as a people, as a lowly NAACP lawyer, not only outside the system, but fighting outside the system, than he was able to do as a Supreme Court justice. Thurgood Marshall sat on the bench and oversaw the dismantling of the laws that, and, 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 and reforms that he secured for us as, while he was arguing in front of the bench. And then as the final insult to injury, they replaced him with Clarence Thomas. So Thurgood Marshall would have literally been more of an asset and was literally more of an asset to our people fighting against the system than he was in some one of the highest positions, most vaunted and honored positions within the system. But it goes down the line. Let's not just, just bang on Thurgood Marshall and go check me. Fight me. Don't fight me. I'm sick of these threats of violence and all that. But anyway, um, they say the more black police you get. Now, when I, let me give another personal example. I worked at Rikers Island for over three years in the infirmary. I came out of school. I was fresh out of a downstate uh, radiography program. And when you're a student, nobody wants to hire students. Well, this is the old thing. Now, but it, I can't even get into that. It used to be students had to struggle to get jobs, make themselves, and they had to take the lowest level jobs because, number one, they didn't pay very much, and they figured you had to pay your dues to get up in the professions. Now, the students, you're more likely to be serviced by an inexperienced student than because nobody, because once you get to your 13, 14, 15 year, nobody wants to hire you because they don't want to pay you. And who suffers? You know, you get more profit, and only the patient suffers, so to hell with it. But anyway, when I got out, everybody was like, yo, the first place I went to was to University Hospital. I want to work at University Hospital. It's all fancy, fancy, crispy scrubs. And it's like, no. And I'm like, fine, I want to work at the vaunted historical Kings County Hospital. And it's like, step off. We ain't hiring you. You green. You don't know. You ain't been nowhere. You ain't done nothing. You fresh out of school. You know, what are we going to hire you for? So, you know, I kind of went around a little bit, and then they were like, dude, let me tell you something. You got to go work at some seedy little clinic. You know, you got to work at some some little seedy little, you know, offshoot. You know, go work at, I ain't going, I don't want to name the hospital because there's people that probably got loved ones in these places and stuff, so I ain't going. But they tell you, you know, you got to go to one of these places. These are the kind of places that hire students that are just been out of school two weeks. And I said, you know, I need a yah. You know, the whole purpose of existence and, and over, uh, you know, you know, 20 million years of, of primate evolution has come to the pinnacle of this mighty brain. I'm only here to work a job and then consume products and then so that I can work more. You know, I don't think that's the purpose of humanity. I don't know why we fight for jobs. There's so many better things to fight. But anyway, I went to work at Rikers Island because that's a job. And I ain't saying now, maybe now. Rikers Island has state-of-the-art facilities and they have well-trained, well-seasoned radiographers and, and doctors and all that. But back then, they just had nurses and maybe a couple of PAs. They didn't even have, they, most of the, the medical staff were CNAs. It was, it was horrible. It was Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine or School of Medicine had contracted to provide infirmary services. But anyway, I think I'm getting a bit off the point. I went to work there. First job. First union job, first salary job, first job as a professional. I had made it. I had reached the promised land. That's what King got shot in the neck for. So I could, you know, have a title, letters after my name, uh, a, a, a degree with a gold metallic sticker on it and some white man's signature in the corner that I never saw while I was a student at the institution. I had made it. You know, and I had come out to projects, didn't have a father, and my mother's on drugs, and my grandma, you know, I was a tip, I was the American dream. You know, 
Now, I didn't have Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. There were some other things that kind of sullied this, this triumphant story of success. But we don't even talk about that. Somebody going from, like, abject poverty to, you know, lower middle class. That's not, you know, we, you know, you can't, unless I made, you know, you got to be freaking go from poverty to a millionaire. Wicked jump shot. Slanging crack rock. But anyway, I was one of the lesser known stories of making it. You know, they wouldn't put, I, I would, it's not like a different world. I didn't go work for Kenichiwa Industries. Anyway, again, off the topic. I went to work there, and over 80%, because uh, this is the point, I ain't even talking about my triumphant rise from obscurity and poverty. It's not even the subject here. But, anyway, 80% of the CEOs were, were, were uh, black people. Of 80% of the CEOs being black people, a large percentage of those corrections officers were of West Indian descent, Jamaican, Trinidadian, Bayesian, Haitian. In fact, my immediate supervisor, one was Haitian and one was Guyana, Guyanese. And they did not treat, and of course, do I even need to state the statistics of the prisoners? All the prisoners was Mo's and Mosetta's. That's uh, Mackie used to call black folks. Mo's and Mosetta. That's all with black folks. That's all black folks. So the vast majority of the prisoners were black. The vast majority of the pri of of the the um, COs were black. Yet, you know, man to man is unjust. There were the same atrocities, the same degradation, the same abuses, the same neglect that whites up in the state, where the majority are whites, up in the state the county, the federal penitentiary where the COs were white, the black COs behaved exactly like the white COs. And I mean like you got a dude locked in a metal cage and they got these high pressure water hoses spraying dudes that I would see people coming within. I mean, Jay-Z just made a documentary. I mean, I, I, I guess we know this, how brutal black folks with a badge can be, with a title, attack dogs, coons, Sambos, I treat those coons for you, boss. We know it. it ain't nothing new. But we figured, now the head man on the plantation, but these professionals, but these people are the role models. And I'm not just talking about the brutal ignorant. I mean, they, these people were aggressively and deliberately uneducated. And I don't know, maybe they wanted to remain ignorant so that they could live with what they were doing. Maybe they did have a level of consciousness and empathy. So they were like, I just will not acknowledge what's going on here. I will tell myself that every inmate here is here because they are a blight on society. And me not only keeping this person locked up, but keeping this person beat down and abused. Or allowing other prisoners to abuse this individual. By doing this, I'm doing a service to society. I don't know what lies we tell ourselves. Because there were conscious, there were CEOs in there that would wear red, black, and green. You know. They be in there, and, and, and uh, I remember I actually went to work on the day of the Million Man March. I didn't support the Million Man March. And there were literally thousands of CEOs, black CEOs, who went to the Million Man March. And when they came back, they engaged in the same damn behaviors. And I know, I'm not, um, I'm not idealizing the inmates. A scumbag, rapist, pedophile, thieves, this, this, and that. But as a professional myself, I understood that they say the very concept of professionalism is being able to distance your own personal judgments and your own personal views to execute your job. You know, and to be able to treat. If you have an injured person, I don't care if you have a fractured femur, it doesn't matter if you're a pedophile or, you know, a uh, what? What's a noble profession? A baker. You're supposed to be able to give that person the, the necessary treatment, and it's not up to you as a professional to go beyond your mandate and to pass judgment or to heap punishment on this individual. It's about professionalism. But this wasn't even about punishing the bad and the good. It was just some deep, sick, sadistic behavior. You know, from in from from COs. Everything from extortion to rape to just basic torture and mutilation. And these were black people. You know, and, and, and it wasn't long before people saw that I wasn't with the program. 
that I really wasn't like, yo, I just, I was actually shocked. But hey, I was how old when I started there? I was 20 years old. Rikers Island. I think it was 91, 93 or 94 I started there. 1993, 94. And, you know, it, it was a nightmare. And it was all black people treating other black people like those black people. Like white people, black people acting like white people towards other black people. And I'd never really seen it that intense. Now, I've seen it in the hood, but I've never seen it on an institutional level. I've seen gangsters and street thugs and hustlers and pimps act in a predatory way towards other blacks. But I've never seen black folks in an official capacity like that. Like you'd see the occasional black cop run, ride through the hood. But you know, this is, Rikers Island is a contained. You know, I worked at uh, GMDC. I work at Rose M. Singer Center. Yeah, I can say the names. You can snitch on the enemy. It's like uh, Cameron said that it's okay to snitch on Trump. So I figure anytime you're telling on white folks, white institutions, or black people acting on behalf or in the interest of white folks, tell away. Name names. You know, underage girls getting impregnated by both CEOs and even wardens. At Rosem Singer Center, I've seen it. They put the, the, the young inmate in a, uh, for it. That's rape. You can't have consensual sex with someone who doesn't, who doesn't have the authority to consent or not to, or to, to, to deny consent. But them was all, all of them. It was all black. And you can't even say it was black on black crime because the black people weren't acting in the interest or on behalf of black people. They were acting in the interest of whites. You know. So if you got a brother overseas in Indonesia and in, in Pakistan, in Iraq, Afghanistan, killing people, he ain't killing them for Mose and Mosetta. He ain't killing them for us. He's killing them on behalf of the U.S. Empire. That we had no part in constructing. They don't even consult us. You know, they don't even consult us. They, they, when they come up with the agenda for the empire, they might say how many jobs within this agenda we have to set aside for colored folks. But they don't say, well, what do the blacks think? You know, what would the black? What are their preferences? What, what? How would they like to proceed with this war on terror? So you can't blame us for constructing the agenda, but I guess we're all individually accounting, accountable for our own personal participation and aid we provide to the agenda. So to say all that to say, black folks, you know, um, we, we, and I'm, and let me back this up, because now black folks, what, a lot, what I get a lot of times, I'll say all this. I'll say, look, you know, black people in positions of authority Generally, you, it, it, number one, if you are truly a revolutionary. Now, we love, I love the spook who sat by the door. You know, I love it. But guess what? That is fiction. That is fiction. Ain't no spooks who sat by the door. You know, I'm sorry. I mean... We do have some pe we do have some real life spooks. And Geronimo Jajaga Pratt, who went off to the military and came back from the military and brought all of his military expertise, know how, everything from weapons and tactics and strategies, and, and, and began to, to train black people. You know, you have people like Bob Marley, who took his considerable fame and wealth and, 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 and gave over those resources to uh Gave over those resources to Zimbabwe, anti-colonial struggle. So I'm not saying that the, the, you, you have uh, several trained, educated, uh, skilled, resourced black individuals that say, hey, I'm going to commit what they call class suicide. But one of the rarest phenomenons in human history is class suicide, where someone has a particular status in society and they step down from that status and begin to undermine their own class interest on behalf of a lower class. That's a very rare 
You know, Che Guevara is probably the most internationally recognized, you know, come from an affluent family. He was a physician. And you go from, you know, posh, clean doctor's office and a clean living to, to being in the trenches of the Amazon jungle in, engaged in warfare. So it does happen. But for every, but for every person that, that engages in class suicide, you know there's a million who hold to their, what, 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 um, what's his name? Gosh, Steve Coakley. Steve Coakley called the Oath Takers or the boule. Now boule used to be a very specific servants to the king or advisors to the king. It used to be a very specific group, but then the boule kind of expanded to be a catchphrase for all professional negroes who serve willingly and enthusiastically serve the interests of our oppressors. So even though you're not a member of the boule fraternity, you can, people will call you a boule if you act there acting like a boule, you know, like Eddie Johnson. The police superintendent, I don't know if he's an official member of the Boule, but he's definitely carrying out the, the, the mission, the, the standing mission and objectives of the Boule. So, every brother ain't a brother. I don't know. That's a simple way. There's artistic people that can say it simpler than me, like the, the, the legendary. I got to quit saying legendary because, I mean, I don't know. If I like somebody, I, if I like an artist, they're legendary. I say that too much. I'll just say, the, the, you know, but I guess he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so I guess he's legitimate for real. Like, white folks think he's legendary, so. Argue me now. But the legendary uh, Chuck, Chuck D. Every brother ain't a brother. Black's driving, black thriving, making it. Anyway, now just go all the way. Let's find our way out of these various rabbit holes and, and, and diversions. And get back to my original point that, because I didn't, because when I say that the black gangsters don't go into affluent white areas, all the way back to that point. But I just did wanted to say it's not just uneducated criminals; it's educated criminals. I also, go back to uh, the Amos Wilson well. I'll go back to that often, shamelessly, and in, and 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 with full of pride, bursting with pride. Amos and Wilson. Amos Wilson said the, the, the type of crimes that people commit are, are, are related to their, their social standing and their education and capabilities. So an accountant is not going to rob you with a jackknife or a pistol. An accountant is going to rob you using paper and computers. But if a young, but a, a young kid in the street who didn't have adequate housing, didn't have adequate you know, food, shelter, clothing, education, didn't have adequate nutrition, anything, then he doesn't know how to rob you using, you know, a clipboard, fast talk, and a computer. So he's going to use a pistol. Because that's what, it's, it's not because the accountant is any more moral, any more civilized, any more just, any more respectable than a street level criminal. He just have a different skill set. Just has a different skill set. That's all. And so, but all the way back to my distinction between Shytopia and Chirac. And I, for one, am not offended by the concept of Chirac. I, you know, if it's real, it's real. You know, if you go to a doctor and then the doctor says, I'm sorry, but you have a metastatic tumor. I'm so offended. How dare you say such a thing? If it's an accurate diagnosis, it's an accurate diagnosis. Don't be offended by an accurate diagnosis. And Chicago, and, and there were a lot of people say, oh, we don't claim that. We shot town. Nah, Chirac is fully appropriate title. And I know some, if you're a drill artist, you're saying that with pride. Because, you know, if your city is, 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 is where the guns is blazing, bodies is dropping, you know, rocks is moving, hoes is getting pimped, then it, it's good for your persona because you're trying to sell music to white people. And white people, since, since they first encountered Africans on the slave ships, on the slave shacks, they have always have gotten a sadistic pleasure out of seeing our degradation, out of, not even sadistic, they got a sexual arousal from black suffering. 
Now, I don't, I'm not as educated as Freud is, so I can't get too deep in it. He did some level explain, you know, the, the pathos, eros, you know, death, sex, you know, complex. But I don't even want to get into that. It's just a fact. Whether they seeing some drug inebriated black man on stage with his pants around his ankle mumbling, or whether they're seeing some black man, you know, in tattered clothing, dancing a jig, blowing in a, in a, in a, in a rum jug on a plantation. White people have always, if, they, if we wouldn't voluntarily provide them with menstrual inter, in, entertainment, they would force us to give them menstrual entertainment. If they couldn't, weren't in a position to force us to give them degraded images of black people to entertain them, they would paint their own faces black and do it. But they needed to see us like that. And so if I'm an aspiring rapper, and I know, like KRS-One said, selling going platinum doesn't make you the authority. It just meant you sold out to the white majority. Most of this death culture, death music is consumed by white folks. Black kids don't have, just like the drug game. The cocaine, world cocaine and opium trade is fueled by affluent white people, not by poor. I'm telling you, like I said Wednesday. The neighborhood crackhead don't have the resources. I don't care how many of their grandma's VCRs and, and, and microwaves they stole. They don't have enough money to provide Mexican drug cartels with gold-plated AK-47s. That came from Wall Street. That came from these affluent suburbs, these trophy rives. And can we blame them? Melania, you don't think Melania's getting high? She got to lay up under that orange amoeba every night or, you know... A night or two and evacuate her bladder on him. I mean, that'll lead anybody to token. I said it. Allegedly. Let me say it like, because Donald Trump, you know, all these bully fascists are some of the thin skinned crybabies. That's for these black fascists and the white ones. Thin skinned. My goodness. But anyway, let's, 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 let's get back on, on topic because I, I know I'm all over the place. I went to a vegan party last night. It got lit. There was just organic green tea popping everywhere. Tofu bites just overflowing. You know, we were we were throwing, you know, incense smoke all infusing the air. You know, and then King Dita came out with the with the with the homemade whipped shea butter infused with 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 with, with scented essences. And he was just like, hey, smell, I mean, it just got lit, it got wild, y'all, but you don't know, we about that life. But anyway, the drug game. How did I even get on that? Because, oh my goodness, it's, seven, it's almost at the top of the hour, Q4 Radio, Bro Diallo Show, AM 1680, broadcasting out of Shytopia slash Chirac. And I haven't even started on my topic. I just wanted had wanted to say something about black folks not being willing to commit atrocities against white people, even as they commit atrocities against us. Every week I see a post on social media, a tweet, I read some young person's blog, and they were like, over the, since, since uh, Trayvon Martin's uh, death, there have been, you know, 12,000 incidents of black people killing, shooting, harming other black people. Yet, Zimmerman is still on Twitter, smoking cigars, and daring somebody to step to him. But there's a reason for that. That's a deep psychological reason for that. And because and there's a couple of other points. There's this concept that I have called the plantation buck. And the plantation buck was a slave like every other slave. He wasn't a head slave, he wasn't a house slave, he was a rank and file cotton picker. But again, that's, that's a stereotype. Like I said, black folks were doing industrial scale projects. We weren't just picking cotton. But then, you know, let's just, like I said, we can't cover everything in, this, in every segment. So let me get professional. But this guy, when it came time to do the work, he picked the cotton. But when, when the slaves were done from can to can't, they worked from sun up to sundown. When the sun started to set and it was too dark for them to toil anymore, they'd have to retreat to their barracks, to their shacks, you know, 
just far enough away from the from the the the, the big house so that the the plantation and mistress wasn't bothered by the scent and they would begin their harassment of other enslaved Africans. And they were often stronger, bigger, more aggressive than the other Africans. And they would maybe take their rations, engage in, in rape and assault, you know, and demeaning, just compounding the misery that our ancestors already suffered under. But the very moment any authority showed up, whether it was a house slave, a head man, or the, the master or the mistress himself, this guy would revert from a, from a, a blood thirsty wolf to a kindly puppy. And he would never use his strength, his aggression, his anger, never take it out on authority. He would direct all of his aggression against his own people and never step to those of authority. In fact, when the other Africans would mobilize to fight, he would either remain neutral or join with the oppression. That was the plantation buck. Everybody hated him, but it wasn't really nothing you could do to him because if you, you dealt with him in the way he should be dealt with, then you're harming master's property. And, and, and the master, the enslaver, he understood, he knew what was going, but he, the, the buck was tolerated because he said, you know, this guy sows distrust. He gets black people to think, I've been treated worse by my own people than Massa. Buck do me worse than my own people treated me worse than white people ever have. Even though the, 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 the buck is a creation product owned lock, stock, and barrel. Wouldn't exist if not for the master. But hey, that's how we like to rationalize. Buck, master gave me an extra bucket of chitlins and Buck clicked in my door and took it. Right? So then we start to even think, oh, the master is benevolent and it's this no good nigga that I've got to deal with. We got to, before we can even think about the white, we got to get rid of these niggas. And the white man gets paid off of all of that. So the buck was always tolerated. Was always, even though he was violating the white man's laws, the, the master's laws and rules for plantation conduct, there was a blind eye to, her, to that. But let Buck get a little idea to say, hey, I, why am I robbing people who ain't got next to nothing? Master got everything. Let me go and take some. Let me go steal a little, uh, uh, some silver, some silverware. Let me go steal directly from Master. And then the most harsh punishment imaginable will be brought down on him. To drive throughout the generations, it's better to pray on our own than to go at the authority. Same thing. So if you are Black Panther, you get COINTELPRO assassinations and the full weight of the government is leveled against you. If you're trying to not just do something illegal, but I just want to feed kids. I just want to make sure people have housing. I just want uh, appropriate uh, education. I want literacy amongst my people. I want nothing more than what the government had already promised us. I'm not even asking for more than what you already said you're willing to give. Oh, COINTELPRO for your ass. But he's like, I want to start a cartel, sell drugs, pimp women, traffic children for illicit purposes. And the government's like, oh, what do we do? There's a plague and scourge of gangs and there's nothing we can do. What? Oh, how do we stop this? We'll lock up one and just more pop up. We can't. They just can't figure out or destroy the, the gang culture. But they were able to do, and, and, and what's ironic is many of these gangs go talk to them. And they're, they're surprisingly accessible. In fact, they like to talk to people. They, they starve for somebody to just for human engagement and talk, contact. You know, I mean, if they're out hustling or, or doing their work, then don't disrupt. You don't want them messing with you when you're at your job. But if you have an opportunity, if you want to co contact me, I'll introduce you to some young people. But you can talk to them in their leisure time, just like people can talk to you when you're in your leisure time. And they'll tell you. They'll talk. So, it's, it, well, okay. What time? Oh, my goodness. It's 8 on. Um, I have to take a, a break. I, I went way over, indulging myself way too much. And now I know I told people I was going to stay on topic. I do have my notes. But when I come back, I want to deal with, um, 
this concept of a feminization of black men, homosexuality, black conservatism, and all that. Now, I had planned to talk about this. It just so happens out of nowhere. There was some cat online talking about we need to get rid of black women, black women are the worst thing, blah, blah, blah. And he said, basically, black women hate black men. So I just, out of humor, because I mean, by the time a dude saying something like, there ain't really no rational argument. You can't really engage in discourse when someone's that far gone in their thinking. But I was like, black women don't hate black men, they just hate you. And then, of course, that just blew up and boiled over into, and eventually grew into death threats. But then, I was engaged in another discussion about veganism. And about, you know, my basic position was, you know, uh, King Dita was basically asserting that children are not inherently meat eaters. It's a learned behavior. And I was just chimed in on that because they said a little child crying because his mother cut a fish. And I said, you know, anatomically and physiologically, we're not meat eaters. We have to do what they call pre-digest our meat, which means cook our meat. No other predatory omnivore or carnivore has to do that. And we don't do it because it's just to taste. And when I say cook and prepare our meat, a true carnivore and a true omnivore will bite right through the hide and the fur and all that. Now, I'm not saying that you have to do that to prove that you're a true carnivore or omnivore. I'm saying you should at least have the capacity to do that. But I'm saying we don't have the claws, we don't have the fangs, we don't have the, the gastrointestinal shape or size, and we don't have the concentration of gastric acid for all that. Now you want to see me get in my element, give me an apple. I'll take an apple right off the tree. Don't rinse it off or nothing, and I'll bite right into it. I'll take a tomato off the vine. Nothing. I'll go get a, toma a, 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 a watermelon. And I'll stalk that watermelon, I'll pounce on it, rip it off the vine, bash it, and bite right into it. Because I think that's my natural thing to do. Even in the most primitive way, I will consume it. Now, of course, what I normally do is I cut the, the food, I season a little bit, I hook it up. But if I had to, or if I wanted to, I could eat it in its most natural state. Let me see any of y'all who love chicken go to the coop. Pounce on the back of the chicken and tear right into it. I ain't even saying you got to eat the feathers. Just eat your way through. Because I, I don't want to eat the rind of the melon. But bust it open and tear into it. And just see how appetizing that. You get your boys, because I know this is a bigger animal. Gather up your posse. You love your ribs. You like your steaks. Your porterhouse. Your, your, your quarter pounders. Get you and five of your homies and say, look at that Hereford cow in the, in chewing on its cud. Bum rush it. Knock it over. And with your bare hands in the natural state, since you're a natural meat eater, figure out how to get through the hide. But then there are some creatures that don't really have the claws either, the, the omnivore, like vultures. So they don't really have the strength to tear through the hide like a lion. So they go in through the mouth or through the anus. So those parts are vulnerable. And then they pick open and, 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 and work their way out through the anus to get into the succulent meat that you love so much. And that was my point, basically. I was just saying humans are not shaped to be. It's an adaptation. And it's an ad if it's an adaptation, it's one that you can depart from without any serious harm to yourself, but with great benefit to yourself and your, the world ecosystems. So this dude jumps on the feed and was like, I think you should eat meat. And by the way, Diallo's a homosexual, Diallo's a pro, promosexual, and then just start going in, and I'm like, what? What? And then dude's like, we had a conversation two years ago. And I said, I'm sorry, but if it was strictly a social media, uh, if we haven't worked together, if there's no contracts and no investment, no, no real work, it, it, I'm sorry, but I don't really hold... To, to, and it turns out our argument was actually three, almost four years old, but somehow this dude was carrying this on. I did not remember this guy whatsoever. But anyway, this is even before. So then it, it was, it's a good way for me to get into the, the, the topic I want to deal with. Because I don't think people really understand my positions on all of this. 
Well, maybe they understand it, they just don't agree with it. Either way, I'm like everybody else on social media. If you don't agree with me, then you don't understand. <laughs> or you're stupid, or you're evil, or you're wrong. I don't know. Let's take a musical break. And when we come back, we'll uh, get more into uh, the actual topic of the day. And I'm just saying, you know, you black gangster hustler thugs, all you got to do, it don't take much to move from gang. You can't be gangster and revolutionary. I don't care what the RBG movement says. But if you would simply change your personal material goal for criminality into a collective uh, political gains instead of individual material gains, collective political gains, same gangsterism. Bust your guns, grind, and, and overthrow the system, rise up, you know what I'm saying? And you will be remembered. Nobody remembers the gangster thugs hustle. We remember our freedom fighters. So if you want to make a name for yourself, take up arms in the name of justice, liberation, preserving the world's ecosystem, liberating and protecting our people. Our children and women specifically. You know what I'm saying? That's all. Oh, thanks for tuning in to uh, live. I'm actually surprised it's working. I've been having a lot of trouble with Facebook lately. But anyway, thanks for tuning in live. Um, make sure you go. Oh, let me show you. I'm getting high off my own supply. See that? It's backwards, but you can get the gist of it. You know, go to African World Order. You can get some of these fly apparel, positive progressive clothing. Go to um, AfricanWorldOrder.com. Also, you can listen to the rest of this show at Q4 Radio. I know it wasn't up there, but it's up there now. So you can continue to listen live to this show at Q4 or on the Q4 Radio Facebook page. You will find this show archived at Diallo Kenyatta. Dot com and I'm almost fully updated I'm this this weekend I will be 100% updated on the archives so all the archives will be current with all of the past shows and with extra content for 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 people who subscribe or who support through patreon there'll be all kinds of new video audio and written content to, to help support the show and help suspend expand two four radio expand the Kiana Kenyatta media group and the African world coalition so there's a lot going on shout out to team Dita uh, we just hired uh, another dozen youth for our green teens program and we're able to pay them ten dollars and twenty five cents an hour to learn about ecology urban agriculture uh, and how to preserve the local ecosystem while advocating and fighting for the world ecosystem. So, really excited about our second year doing the Green Teens program. Anyway, thanks for listening. Peace.